So thank you. We heard about multi-binit and we heard about scale up and now I will speak about the connection between the both. Um, I've been lucky to be uh, spending the last three months in um, the university in Cantabria. I normally do my PhD with Philip in Liège, so I've been traveling between the uh, two worlds and now uh, um, this talk is about the results of these uh, last few months. So basically I have two subjects. The first is how in practice to construct now lattice models that involve some degree of complexity and then show a bit how the interface uh, between multi uh, minute and scale up, how I have set it up and what it can do. So let's start first with the uh, lattice models. So um, Jolan just explained that the basic idea of the lattice model in multi minute is to develop uh, to describe the total energy of a system as a Taylor development about a reference energy and then to um, separate the perturbation energy into phonon strain and strain phonon part and then all of these uh, components get their own uh, respective Taylor development. In practice this means that we want to get some ab initio data and so here I'm looking just in one dimension and uh, get some initial data and want to transfer that into a poly polynomial expression. And in one dimension this looks then quite easy and what we um, do, at least that the harmonic part we extract from uh, DFPT directly and the higher order we fit to the data that we have. Now, as I say, if you look just in one dimension this seems very straightforward but then if you look at real materials, how does the situation present itself? So if you look at the reference that we want to develop our metal mo uh, model around, for example, calcium titanate would be the cubic perovskite phase. And so we look at the phonon band structure and what we see is that we have many, many, many instabilities in all over the Brearian zone. So we would have to, we will have to create a potential that tracks all these instabilities correctly. And then when we look, how does the ground state structure look like of, of uh, calcium titanate? see that in that phase, which is that's PNMA symmetry, uh, there are condensed five different modes, which might contain multiple atomic displacements and two different strains. So this make, makes already uh, quite high, gives quite a minimum high uh, dimensionality that the uh, lattice potential will have to have. Then the displacements in this phase might be quite large. So one of the oxygens is moving from, uh, from its reference position about half an angstrom, which is 10% of the lattice constant in this material. So this is inherently a problem for Taylor expansion exp since we are moving quite far from our reference position. And then we have a lot of competing phases, which makes also this material complex for the experimentalists at high temperature. So I have diff a number of different phases that are competing with that phase. So this means we will have probably have a quite flat energy landscape that we have to track. So the m first question is how to sample this energy landscape. Why, how do we get um, the data to fit? And one way to, that was put forward to do that is to use ab initio molecular dynamics uh, that we start from the reference con configuration from the cubic and just let it relax to the ground state phase and let it vibrate around so that we get a non-biased uh, random sampling of the um, uh, potential energy surface. And what this provides us is quite nicely a path between the reference and the ground state that is probably the most uh, favorable one. So now I can use this data and do a free, do a fit using multi -binit. So uh, here I fitted 60 terms and the um, the precision that we get is already quite nice. So we have four millivs per atom, uh, mean square difference with respect to all over the training set data, which is quite good when we um, take into account that the drop between the reference and the ground state is more than 60 millivs. Now what you see here in this video is a, model is a molecular dynamics run with this uh, 60 terms model at 50 Kelvin, and this goes directly to the ground state. And so we're, we're really happy with that, that it, we seem to reproduce 
already the, the physics of calcium titanate. And what highlights why we are doing is that these 5,000 steps that I calculated to make this video took uh, 70 seconds on my laptop. Because now um, the, uh, evaluating the energy at any given atomic position is just a matrix multiplication. Now, we are not there yet because, as uh, Jordan highlighted, uh, boundedness is a big problem. So if I increase the temperature or the cell size in these models, we can look at the last frame. What happens is that they just explode at some point. So there's negative diversity. So this doesn't look very physical, let's say. And where is this coming from? What's the origin of the problem? Is that when we go back to the ab initio data that we get from the molecular dynamics, what happens is that uh, we sampled the surface in an area around the high symmetry uh, reference and we go to the ground state but we don't go very, very far over it so we just vibrate a little bit around it. And then when we fit the potential what might happen is that we have a really good reproduction of that data in the potential but outside of the data this potential might diverge to negative infinity uh, and we won't even see it that this is a problem because this happens outside the data range that we have. And then this explains the behavior of the model because for low temperatures we are trapped in that minimum and if we increase the temperature we just jump over the barrier and never come back. So what we want to have is a bound potential that then that extrapolates to positive infinity in all possible directions. And the straightforward idea to get such a bound potential is just to add higher order terms that are not even, uh, that are even and have a positive coefficient in the direction of the diverging uh, displacement uh, in the potential. So the question is how do we keep the precision, uh, precision? And I propose a simple algorithm to do that and it's just to, once we have a potential, once we have the red line in the figure before where we know we are sampling very well the data that we have. Um, fix that potential and check for each term in that potential, is, it, is this a diverging term or not? So is this term odd or even with a negative coefficient? And then if that's the case, just add all the possible higher order uh, terms for that displacement. So if we had, for example, a term that is a trilinear product, uh, add all the possible higher order terms in a given range that the user can specify and then what I want to do is to reduce the coefficient such that this term doesn't take a significant value in the range of the data that we have because we just want that it's active outside of the range of data that we have so it extrapolates a positive infinity but doesn't change the precision inside the range of data that we have. So for the calcium titanate model we had 60 terms. If I run the algorithm, I find that actually 50, almost all of them <laughs> are odd uh, or even with a negative coefficient and then I find 283 or 200, about 220 more terms to um, um, bound that potential and we see that the algorithm works in the sense that now the green line is still uh, very close to the ab initio data. It's even in respect to the energy, it's a bit better, but we lose on the forces on the stresses and precision. And now this model is bound. So I can run a large supercell with 20,000 atoms in the dynamics. And I can do, um, so what I did here in the simulation is to do, try to extract what is the uh, volume expansion of that model. And so I did a uh, temperature screening from zero to 1,600K and um, I did each of these crosses here represent 6,000 MD steps and then the average volume in, these, um, uh, in this run. And each of these crosses took about one hour to calculate on a noticeably bigger machine than my laptop, but um, it's still a scale that's not um, accessible to first principles. So what we see here is that at least to until 600K, we are doing not so bad compared to experiments. So this is already a nice re result for us. So we think that at least the ground state phase of calcium titanate is nicely tracked with this model. And then the model seems to go to phase transition and de deviates from uh, the experimental measurement. So we have to evaluate, but 
how we can improve, but I think it's mainly a question of getting more first principle data that is representative for these kind of distortions with respect to uh, the uh, experiment. So that's it on the lattice models. And now we'll go to uh, multi binion and scale up that I was uh, working on in the last three to four months in uh, Santander. And Okay, Pablo and Javier explained already a lot about this, but what happens when we do this effective um, lattice model is that we basically hide the um, electronic informations in the parameters in our tail Taylor expansion. So the, the response of the electrons to the lattice perturbation will, de will determine uh, the sign and the strength of the parameters in the lattice expansion. So we kind of describe, uh, the model in implicitly um, uh, contains the information of body electrons, but not explicitly. We don't have any access to it. So we can reintroduce some electronic states of interest with scale up in the way uh, Pablo described with a Mott Hubbard model that has been rewritten in a way that now the, the central quantity is the density, a different density matrix such that, uh, which is clever in the sense that as long as we're staying on the or an Oppenheimer surface that we want to uh, sample, uh, this quantity is zero and the electronic part doesn't do any correction, but we still get access to the electronic structure at any given uh, atomic configuration as the electron lattice coupling is expressed in the explicit dependence of the hopping parameters on the atomic structure. And this gives us access then to the electric structure at finite temperature or of large-scale abstracts like domains or um, skirmions and so on. And then what will be interesting for uh, magnetic systems to, to look for different magnetic orders in their respective, energy, uh, respective energies or for um, uh, excited states like excitons and polarons where the lattice, cup lattice electron couplings will be important. So scale-up has a library mode that I uh, used to, that is very practical <laughs> to create an interface so we can just couple it to scale up uh, by linking it as we do with, un uh, with other libraries. And uh, both codes use uh, the XML format to, to store the model information. So we can use just, we have just have one file that co can contain the electronic and lattice information. And so that uh, eventually the interface becomes very simple that we have just very only two um, points at which the two codes interact, and that is when setting up the electronic model. So multi-binit will give two scale up um, the file names that scale up need to set up the electronic model and the electron and the parameters uh, for the run. So do we want to print electronic bands? Do we want to print the DOS or whatever? And what kind of k-point sampling we want? This kind of stuff. And then when we run an MD or we evaluate any given at atomic configuration, that's the second point of interference between the code, the multi-binit will pass the instantaneous atomic configuration to, to scale up and scale up. Uh, we'll do a SEF cycle to evaluate the, um, uh, the electronic model at this given configuration, give back the electronic and force, electronic energy and force contribution. And if we set any print, print options, scale up will print to the disk. So uh, when we do this, we cross at the moment the important barrier in the, in the or frontier in the world of first principles that is uh, between the world of Abinit and the world of Siesta, <laughs> where I have been traveling between at the moment. And um, I mean, there's on the serious um, point, there are two things here that the Abinid world is based on plane waves and the Siesta world on numerica numerical atomic orbitals so that when we want to um, uh, create the models we have to be uh, very careful that the uh, calculations are consistent and on the other hand there are I think it both also a bit different philosophies on developing and distributing the code that we have to look for when we when we want to go on and have to discuss about now I want just to quickly show a uh, first little project that we have with that interface is to treat um, metal insulator transitions in um, uh, perovskites with 
uh, degenerate electronic states in the cubic phase. So this is a very old and, and strongly debated project, uh, uh, subject that uh, incorporates the Antella physics and uh, yeah, there are many ingredients and it has been debated for a long time so this would be value talk in itself. What I want to show is just that okay, um, in, the, uh, transition, in the octahedron in the perovskite the transition metal states will be split into T2G and EG levels and when we have just one electron in the EG levels we arrive to a degenerate electronic state and this is, used, this is, is usually split by a uh, lattice distortion so there's a, a metal insulator transition happening where a lattice distortion appears where the oxy octahedron will deform. So now we try to treat this uh, with the multi minute plus scale up and set up a first electronic model or see what's the necessary ingredients that we need to uh, describe that transition that is uh, here we just included the EG states and uh, the ligand state that uh, ligand P states that lies along the bond and we have effectively four parameters in the model that is U and I on the EG levels and um, the hopping between the uh, ligand and the EG levels and the last parameter is how this ligand will, uh, <laughs> how this hopping will uh, vary with the atomic distortion and I have to finish but for some selected uh, parameters we find that in the cubic phase this is indeed metallic and we find a broad potato around the Fermi level and then when we distort the system uh, in a specific way um, we find a insulating solution that we are supposed to find actually and with that I want to finish and I think I'm happy to do for some questions.